Third Man by Graham Greene. One never knows when the blow may fall. When I saw Rollo Martins first, I made this note on him for my security police files. In normal circumstances, a cheerful fool drinks too much and may cause a little trouble. Whenever a woman passes, raises his eyes and makes some comment, but I get the impression that really he'd rather not be bothered. Has never really grown up, and perhaps that accounts for the way he worshipped lime. I wrote there that phrase, in normal circumstances, because I met him first at Harry Lime's funeral. It was February, and the gravediggers had been forced to use electric drills to open the frozen ground in Vienna's central cemetery. It was as if even nature were doing its best to reject lime. But we got him in at last, and laid the earth back on him like bricks. He was vaulted in, and Rollo Martins walked quickly away, as though his long, gangly legs wanted to break into a run, and the tears of a boy ran down his thirty-five-year-old face. Rollo Martins believed in friendship, and that was why what happened later was a worse shock to him than it would have been to you or me. If only he had come to tell me then what a lot of trouble would have been saved. If you are to understand this strange, rather sad story, you must have an impression at least of the background. The smashed, dreary city of Vienna divided up into zones among the four powers, the Russian, the British, the American, the French zones, regions marked out only by notice boards, and in the center of the city, surrounded by the ring, with its heavy public buildings and its prancing statuary, the Innere Stadt under the control of the four powers. In this once fashionable inner city, each power in turn, for a month at a time, takes, as we call it, the chair, and becomes responsible for security. At night, if you are fool enough to waste your Austrian shillings on a nightclub, you would be fairly certain to see the international power at work. Four military police, one from each power, communicating with each other, if they communicated at all, in the common language of their enemy. I never knew Vienna between the wars, and I'm too young to remember the old Vienna with its Strauss music and its bogus easy charm. To me, it is simply a city of undignified ruins which turned that February into great glaciers of snow and ice. The Danube was a grey, flat, muddy river, long way off across the second Bezirk, the Russian zone where the Prater lay smashed and desolate and full of weeds only the great wheel revolving slowly over the foundations of merry-go-rounds, like abandoned millstones, the rusting iron of smashed tanks which nobody had cleared away, the frost-nipped weeds where the snow was thin. This was roughly the Vienna to which Rollo Martins came on February 7th last year. I've reconstructed the affair as best I can from my own files and from what Martins told me. It's as accurate as I can make it, I've tried not to invent a line of dialogue, though I can't vouch for Martin's memory. An ugly story, if you leave out the girl. Grim and sad and unrelieved, if it were not for that absurd episode of the British Council lecturer. A British subject can still travel if he is content to take with him only five English pounds, which he is forbidden to spend abroad. But if Rollo Martins had not received an invitation from Lyme of the International Refugee Office, he would not have been allowed to enter Austria, which counts still as occupied territory. Lyme had suggested that Martins might write up the business of looking after the international refugees, and although it wasn't Martins' usual line, he had consented. It would give him a holiday and he badly needed the holiday after the incident in Dublin and the other incident in Amsterdam, he always tried to dismiss women as incidents, things that simply happened to him without any will of his own. He told me vaguely that he'd been mixing his drinks. That was another way of putting it. Ronnie Martins' usual line was the writing of cheap paper-covered westerns under the name of Buck Dexter. His public was large but unremunerative. He couldn't have afforded Vienna if Lyme hadn't offered to pay his expenses when he got there out of some vaguely described propaganda fund. Lyme could also, he said, keep him supplied with paper baths, 
the only currency in use from a penny upwards in British hotels and clubs. So it was with exactly five unusable pound notes that Martins arrived in Vienna. An odd incident had occurred in Frankfurt, where the plane from London grounded for an hour. Martins was eating a hamburger in the American canteen when a man he could recognize from 20 feet away as a journalist approached his table. Are you Mr. Dexter, he said. Yes, Martin said, taken off his guard. You look younger than your photographs, the man said. Like to make a statement? I represent the local forces paper here. We'd like to know what you think of Frankfurt. I only touched down ten minutes ago. Fair enough, the man said. What about views of the American novel? I don't read them, Martin said. The well-known acid humor, the journalist said. He pointed at a small gray-haired man with protruding teeth, nibbling a bit of bread. Uh, happen to know if that's Carey? No, what Carey? J.G. Carey, of course. I've never heard of him. Hmm. You novelists live out of the world. He's my real assignment. And Martins watched him make across the room for the great Carey who greeted him with a false headline smile, laying down his crust. Dexter wasn't the man's assignment, but Martins couldn't help feeling a certain pride. Nobody had ever before referred to him as a novelist, and that sense of pride and importance carried him over the disappointment when Lyme was not there to meet him at the airport. We never get accustomed to being less important to other people than they are to us. Martins felt a little jab of dispensability standing by the bus door, watching the snow come sifting down. There was no lime to meet him at the Hotel Astoria, the terminus where the bus landed him, and no message, only a cryptic one for Mr. Dexter, from someone he had never heard of, called Crabbin. We expected you on tomorrow's plane. Please stay where you are. On the way round. Hotel room booked. But Rollo Martins wasn't the kind of man who stayed around. If you stayed around in a hotel lounge, sooner or later, incidents occurred. One mixed one's drinks. I can hear Rollo Martins saying to me, I've done with incidents, no more incidents, before he plunged headfirst into the most serious incident of all. There was always a conflict in Rollo Martins between the absurd Christian name and the sturdy Dutch, four generations back, surname. Rollo looked at every woman that passed, and Martins renounced them forever. I don't know which one of them wrote the Westerns. Martins had been given Lyme's address, and he felt no curiosity about the man called Crabbin. It was obvious that a mistake had been made, though he didn't yet connect it with the conversation at Frankfurt. Lyme had written that he could put Martins up in his own flat, a large apartment on the edge of Vienna that had been requisitioned from a Nazi owner. Lyme could pay for the taxi when he arrived, so Martins drove straight away to the building lying in the third British zone. He kept the taxi waiting while he mounted to the third floor. How quickly one becomes aware of silence, even in so silent a city as Vienna with the snow steadily settling. Martins hadn't reached the second floor before he was convinced that he would not find Lyme there. But the silence was deeper than just absence. It was as if he would not find Lyme anywhere in Vienna, and as he reached the third floor and saw the big black bow over the door handle, anywhere in the world at all. Of course, it might have been a cook who had died, a housekeeper, anybody but Harry Lyme. But he knew, he felt he had known twenty stairs down that Lyme, the lime he had hero worshipped now for twenty years since the first meeting in a grim school corridor with a cracked bell ringing for prayers was gone. Martins wasn't wrong, not entirely wrong. After he had rung the bell half a dozen times, a small man with a sullen expression put his head out from another flat and told him in a tone of vexation, It's no use. There's nobody there. He's dead. Her lime. Here Lyme, of course. Uh, when did it happen? How? He was run over by a car, the man said. Last Thursday. They're burying him this afternoon. You've only just missed them. 
them? Ah, a couple of friends and the coffin. Wasn't he in hospital? There was no sense in taking him to hospital. He was killed here on his own doorstep instantaneously. The right-hand mudguard struck him on his shoulder and bowled him over like a rabbit. Where are they burying him? He asked the stranger on the landing. In the central cemetery. They'll have a hard time of it in this frost. He had no idea how to pay for his taxi, or indeed where in Vienna he could find a room in which he could live for five English pounds. But that problem had to be postponed until he had seen the last of Harry Lyme. He drove straight out of town into the suburb, British zone, where the central cemetery lay. One passed through the Russian zone to reach it and took a shortcut through the American zone, which you couldn't mistake because of the ice cream parlors in every street. Martins had not realized the size of this huge snowbound park where he was making his last rendezvous with Lyme. It was as if Harry had left a message for him, meet me in Hyde Park, without specifying a spot between the Achilles statue and Lancaster Gate. The avenues of graves, each avenue numbered and lettered, stretched out like the spokes of an enormous wheel. They drove for a half mile towards the west, then turned and drove a half mile north, turned south. Even this cemetery was zoned between the powers. The Russian zone was marked by huge, tasteless statues of armed men. The French by rows of anonymous wooden crosses and a torn tricolor flag. Then Martins remembered that Lyme was a Catholic and was unlikely to be buried in the British zone, for which they had been vainly searching. So back they drove through the heart of a forest where the graves lay like wolves under the trees. It was just chance that they found the funeral in time. One patch in an enormous park where the snow had been shoveled aside and a tiny group was gathered, apparently bent on some very private business. A priest had finished speaking, his words coming secretively through the thin, patient snow, and a coffin was on the point of being lowered into the ground. Two men in lounge suits stood at the graveside, one carrying a wreath, but he obviously had forgotten to drop onto the coffin, for his companion nudged his elbow so that he came to with a start and dropped the flowers. A girl stood a little way away with her hands over her face, and I stood twenty yards away by another grave, watching with relief the last of Harry Lyme, and noticing carefully who was there. Just a man in a Macintosh, I was, to Martin's. He came up to me and said, Could you tell me who they're burying? A fellow called Lyme, I said, and was astonished to see the tears start to the stranger's eyes. It didn't look like a man who wept, nor was Lyme the kind of man whom I thought likely to have mourners, genuine mourners with genuine tears. There was the girl, of course, but one accepts women from all such generalizations. Martin stood there till the end, close beside me. He said to me later that as an old friend, he didn't want to intrude on these newer ones. Lyme's death belonged to them, let them have it. He was under the sentimental illusion that Lyme's life, twenty years of it anyway, belonged to him. As soon as the affair was over, Martin strode away on his long legs, which always seemed likely to get entangled together, back to his taxi. He made no attempt to speak to anyone. One's file, you know, is never quite complete. The case is never really closed, even after a century, when all the participants are dead. So I followed Martin's. I knew the other three. I wanted to know the stranger. I caught him up by his taxi, and I said, I haven't any transport. Uh, would you give me a lift into town? Of course, he said. I knew the driver of my jeep would spot me as we came out and follow me unobtrusively. I said, my name's Calloway. Martins, he said. You were a friend of Lyme? Yes. Most people in the last week would have hesitated before they admitted quite so much. Been here long? And he came this afternoon from England. Harry had asked me to stay with him. I hadn't heard. Bit of a shock. Look here, he said. I badly want a drink, but I haven't any cash except five pounds sterling. I'd be awfully grateful if you'd stand me one. It was my turn to say, of course. 
I thought for a moment and I told the driver the name of a small bar in the Kärntnerstrasse. On the door was the usual notice saying the bar was open from six to ten, but one just pushed the door and walked through the front rooms. We had a whole small room to ourselves. The only couple were next door, and the waiter, who knew me, left us alone with some caviar sandwiches. Martin said over his second quick drink, I'm sorry, but he was the best friend I ever had. I couldn't resist saying, knowing what I knew, and because I was anxious to vex him. One learns a lot that way. That sounds like a cheap novelette. He said quickly, I write cheap novelettes. I'd learned something anyway. Until he had had a third drink, I was under the impression that he wasn't an easy talker, but I felt fairly certain he was one of those who turn unpleasant after their fourth glass. I said, uh, tell me about yourself and lime. The glass of chocolate liqueur might have been a crystal, the way he looked at it and turned it this way and that. He said, it was a long time ago. I don't suppose anyone knows Harry the way I do. How long? Twenty years, a bit more. Met in my first term at school. I can see the place. I can see the notice board and what was on it. I can hear the bell ringing. He was a year older and knew the ropes. He put me wise to a lot of things. Was he clever at school? Not the way they wanted him to be. But what things he did think up. He was a wonderful planner. I was far better at subjects like history and English than Harry, but I was a hopeless mug when it came to carrying out his plans. He laughed. He was already beginning, with the help of drink and talk, to throw off the shock of death. He said, I was always the one who got caught. That was convenient for Lyme. What the hell do you mean? he asked. Alcoholic irritation was setting in. Well, wasn't it? That was my fault, not his. Could have found someone cleverer if he'd chosen, but he liked me. When did you see him last? Oh, he was over in London six months ago for a medical congress. You know, he qualified as a doctor, though he never practiced. That was typical of Harry. He just wanted to see if he could do a thing, and then he lost interest. But he used to say it often came in handy. And that was true. It was odd how the lime he knew was to the lime I knew. It was only that he looked at Lyme's image from a different angle or in a different light. He said, One of the things I liked about Harry was his humor. He gave a grin which took five years off his age. I'm a buffoon. I like playing the silly fool, but Harry had real wit. You know, he could have been a first-class light composer if he had worked at it. He whistled a tune. It was oddly familiar to me. I always remember that. I saw Harry write it, just in a couple of minutes on the back of an envelope. That was what he always whistled when he had something on his mind, it was his signature tune. He whistled the tune a second time, and I knew then who had written it. Of course, it was not Harry. I nearly told him so, but what was the point? The tune wavered and went out. He stared down into his glass, drained what was left, and said, It's a damn shame to think of him dying the way he did. It was the best thing that ever happened to him, I said. He didn't take in my meaning at once. He was a little hazy with his drinks. The best thing? Yes. You mean there wasn't any pain? He was lucky in that way, too. It was my tone of voice and not my words that caught Martin's attention. He asked gently and dangerously. I could see his right hand tighten. Are you hinting at something? There's no point at all to showing physical courage in all situations. I eased my chair far enough back to be out of reach of his fist. I said, I mean that I had his case completed at police headquarters. He would have served a long spell, very long spell, if it hadn't been for the accident. What for? He was about the worst racketeer who ever made a dirty living in this city. You're a policeman? he asked. Yes. I've always hated policemen. They're always either crooked or stupid. Is that the kind of book you write? I could see him edging his chair round to block my way out. 
I caught the waiter's eye, and he knew what I meant. As an advantage in always using the same bar for interviews. Martins brought out a surface smile and said gently, You're running true to form, aren't you? I suppose there was some petty racket going on with petrol and you couldn't pin it on anyone, so you picked a dead man. It's just like a policeman. You're a real policeman, I suppose. Yes, Scotland Yard. Where they put me in a colonel's uniform when I'm on duty. He was between me and the door. I couldn't get away from the table without coming into range. I'm no fighter, and he had six inches of advantage anyway. I said, it wasn't petrol. Tires, saccharin. Why don't you policemen catch a few murderers for a change? Well, you could say that murder was part of his racket. He pushed the table over with one hand and made a dive at me with the other. The drink confused his calculations. Before he could try again, my driver had his arms around him. I said, don't treat him rough. He's only a writer with too much drink in him. Be quiet, can't you, sir? My driver said. He had an exaggerated sense of officer class. He would probably have called Lime, sir. Listen, Callahan, or whatever your bloody name is, I'm going to make you look the biggest bloody fool in Vienna. There's one dead man you aren't going to pin your unsolved crimes on. I see. You're going to find me the real criminal. Sounds like one of your stories. You can let me go, Callahan. I'd rather make you look the fool you are than black your bloody eye. You'd only have to go to bed for a few days with a black eye, but when I've finished with you, you'll leave Vienna. I took out a couple of pounds worth of baths and stuck them in his breast pocket. These will see you through tonight, I said, and I'll make sure they keep a seat for you on tomorrow's London plane. You can't turn me out. My papers are in order. Yes, but this is like other cities. You need money here. If you change sterling on the black market, I'll catch up on you within 24 hours. Let him go. Roger Martins dusted himself down. He said, thanks for the drinks. That's all right. I might come and see you off tomorrow. Shouldn't waste your time. I won't be there. Payne here will show you the way to Sachers. You can get a bed and dinner there. I'll see to that. He stepped to one side as though to make way for the waiter and slashed out at me. I just avoided him but stumbled against the table. Before he could try again, Payne had landed him one on the mouth. I'd had a long day and I was tired of Rollo Martin. As I said to Payne, see him safely into Sachers. Don't hit him again if he behaves. And turning away from both of them towards the inner bar, I heard Payne say respectfully to the man he had just knocked down, oh, This way, sir. It's only just round the corner. Uh, what happened next, I didn't hear from Payne, but from Martins a long time afterwards, as I reconstructed the chain of events which did indeed, though not quite in the way he had expected, prove me to be a fool. Payne simply saw him to the headquarters desk and explained, uh, this gentleman came in on the plane from London. Colonel Calloway says he's to have a room. Having made that clear, he said, uh, good evening, sir, and left. He was probably a bit embarrassed by Martin's bleeding lip. Uh, had you already a reservation, sir? The porter asked. No, no, I don't think so, Martin said in a muffled voice, holding his handkerchief to his mouth. I thought perhaps you might be Mr. Dexter. We had a room reserved for a Mr. Dexter. Martin said, Oh, I'm, I am Mr. Dexter. Hmm. He told me later that it occurred to him that Lima might have engaged a room for him in that name because perhaps it was Buck Dexter and not Rollo Martins who was to be used for propaganda purposes. A voice said at his elbow, I'm sorry you were not met at the plane, Mr. Dexter. My name's Crabbin. The speaker was a stout, middle-aged young man with a natural tonsure and one of the thickest pairs of horn-rimmed glasses that Martins had ever seen. He went on apologetically. One of our chaps happened to ring up Frankfurt and heard you were on the plane. HQ made one of their usual foolish mistakes and wired you were not coming. Something about Sweden. But the cable was badly mutilated, 
Uh, directly I heard from Frankfurt, I tried to meet the plane, but I just missed you. You got my note? Martins uh, held his handkerchief to his mouth and said obscurely, Yes. Yes. May I say at once, Mr. Dexter, how excited I am to meet you? Good of you. Ever since I was a boy, I've thought you the greatest novelist of the century. Martins winced. It was painful opening his mouth to protest. He took an angry look instead at Mr. Crabbin, but it was impossible to suspect that young man of a practical joke. You have a big Austrian public, Mr. Dexter, both for your originals and your translations, especially for the curved prowl. That's one of my favorites. Martins was thinking hard. Did you say room for a week? Yes. Very kind of you. Mr. Schmidt here will give you tickets every day to cover all meals, but I expect you'll need a little pocket money. We'll fix that. Uh, tomorrow we thought you'd uh, like a quiet day to look about. Yes. Of course, any of us are at your service if you need a guide. Then the day after tomorrow, in the evening, there's a little quiet discussion at the Institute on the contemporary novel. We thought perhaps you'd say a few words just to set the ball rolling and then answer questions. Martins, at that moment, was prepared to agree to anything to get rid of Mr. Crabbin. He said, now, of course, of course, into his handkerchief. Excuse me, Mr. Dexter, have you got a toothache? I, I know a very good dentist. No, somebody hit me, that's all. Good God, were they trying to rob you? No, it was the soldier. I was trying to punch his bloody colonel in the eye. He removed his handkerchief and gave Crabbin a view of his cut mouth. He told me that Crabbin was at a complete loss for words. Martins couldn't understand why, because he had never read the work of his great contemporary Benjamin Dexter. He hadn't even heard of him. I was a great admirer of Dexter, so that I could understand Crabbin's bewilderment. Dexter has been ranked as a stylist with Henry James, but he has a wider feminine streak than his master. Indeed, his enemies have sometimes described his subtle, complex, wavering style as old maidish. For a man still just on the right side of fifty, his passionate interest in embroidery and his habit of calming a not very tumultuous mind with tatting, a trait beloved by his disciples, certainly to others seems a little affected. Have you ever read a book called The Lone Rider of Santa Fe? No, I don't think so, Martin said. Uh, this lone rider um, had his best friend shot by the sheriff of a town called Lost Claim Gulch. The story is how he hunted that sheriff down, quite legally, until his revenge was completed. I never imagined you reading westerns, Mr. Dexter, Crabbin said and it needed all Martin's resolution to stop Rollo saying, but I write them. Well, I'm gunning just the same way for Colonel Callahan. Never heard of him. Heard of Harry Lyme? Uh, yes, Crabbin said cautiously, but I didn't really know him. I did. He was my best friend. I shouldn't have thought he was a very uh, literary character. None of my friends are. Crabbin blinked nervously behind the horn rims. He said with an air of appeasement, uh, he was interested in the theatre, though. A friend of his, an actress, you know, is learning English at the Institute. Uh, he called once or twice to fetch her. Young or old? Oh, young, very young. Not a good actress, in my opinion. Martins remembered the girl by the grave with her hands over her face. He said, I'd like to meet any friend of Harry's. She'll probably be at your lecture. Austrian? Uh, she claims to be Austrian, but I suspect she's Hungarian. Uh, she works at the Josefstadt. Uh, why claims to be Austrian? The Russians sometimes get interested in the Hungarians. I wouldn't be surprised if Lyme had helped her with her papers. Uh, she called herself Schmidt, Anna Schmidt. Can't imagine a young English actress calling herself Smith, can you? And a pretty one, too. Always struck me as a bit too anonymous to be true. 
Martins felt that he had got all he could from Crabbin, so he pleaded tiredness, a long day, promised to ring up in the morning, accepted ten pounds worth of baths for immediate expenses, and went to his room. It seemed to him that he was earning money rapidly, twelve pounds in less than an hour. He was tired. He realized that when he stretched himself out on his bed in his boots. Within a minute, he had left Vienna far behind him and was walking through a dense wood, ankle-deep in snow. He woke suddenly to hear the telephone ringing by his bed. A voice with a trace of a foreign accent, only a trace, said, Is that Mr. Rollo Martins? Yes. It was a change to be himself and not Dexter. You wouldn't know me, the voice said unnecessarily, but I was a friend of Harry Lyme. It was a change, too, to hear anyone claim to be a friend of Harry's. Martin's heart warmed towards the stranger. He said, I'd be glad to meet you. I'm just round the corner at the old Vienna. Uh, couldn't you make it tomorrow? I've had a pretty awful day with one thing or another. Harry asked me to see that you were all right. I was with him when he died. I thought... Rollo Martin said and stopped. He'd been going to say, I thought he died instantaneously, but something suggested caution. He said instead, uh, you're, I haven't told me your name. Kurtz, said the voice. I'd offered to come round to you, only, you know, Austrians aren't allowed to suck us. Uh, perhaps we could meet at the old Vienna in the morning. Certainly, the voice said. If you are quite sure that you are all right till then. How do you mean? Harry had it on his mind that you'd be penniless. Rollo Martins lay back on his bed with the receiver to his ear and thought, come to Vienna to make money. This was the third stranger to stake him in less than five hours. He said cautiously, oh, I can carry on till I see you. There seemed to be no point in turning down a good offer until he knew what the offer was. Shall we say eleven, then, at the old Vienna in the Kertnerstrasse? I'll be in a brown suit and carry one of your books. That's fine. How did you get hold of one? Harry gave it to me. The voice had enormous charm and reasonableness, but when Martins had said good night and rung off, he couldn't help wondering how it was that if Harry had been so conscious before he died, he had not had a cable sent to stop him. Hadn't Callahan too, said that Lyme died instantaneously, or without pain, was it? Or had he put the words into Callahan's mouth? It was then the idea first lodged firmly in Martin's mind that there was something wrong about Lyme's death, something the police had been too stupid to discover. He tried to discover it himself with the help of two cigarettes, but he fell asleep without his dinner and with the mystery still unsolved. It had been a long day, but not quite long enough for that. What I disliked about him at first sight, Martin told me, was his toupee. It was one of those obvious toupees, flat and yellow, with the hair cut straight at the back and not fitting close. There must be something phony about a man who won't accept baldness gracefully. This conversation took place some days later. We were sitting in the old Vienna at the table he had occupied that first morning with Kurtz, and I saw his rather hunted eyes focus suddenly. It was a girl, just like any other girl, I thought, hurrying by outside in the driving snow. Something pretty? He brought his gaze back and said, I'm off that forever. I see. I thought you were looking at a girl. I was, but only because she reminded me for a moment of Anna. Anna Schmidt. Who's she? She was Harry's girl. Are you taking her over? She's not that kind, Callaway. Didn't you see her at the funeral? I'm not mixing my drinks any more. I've got a hangover to last a lifetime. You were telling me about Kurtz, I said. It appeared that Kurtz was sitting there making a great show of reading The Lone Rider of Santa Fe. When Martin sat down at his table, he said with indescribably false enthusiasm, It's wonderful how you keep the tension. Tension? 
Suspense. You are a master at it. At the end of every chapter, one's left guessing. So you are a friend of Harry's, Martin said. I think his best. But Coates added with the smallest pause, in which his brain must have registered the error, except you, of course. Tell me how he died. I was with him. We came out together from the door of his flat, and Harry saw a friend he knew across the road, an American called Cooler. He waved to Cooler and started across the road to him when a jeep came tearing round the corner and bowled him over. It was Harry's fault, really, not the driver's. Somebody told me he died instantaneously. I wish he had. He died before the ambulance could reach us, though. He could speak, then. Yes. Even in his pain, he worried about you. What did he say? I can't remember the exact words, Rollo. I may call you Rollo, mayn't I? He always called you that to us. He was anxious that I should look after you when you arrived. See that you were looked after. Get your return ticket for you. In telling me, Martin said, <laughs> You see, I was collecting return tickets as well as cash. Why didn't you cable to stop me? We did, but the cable must have missed you. What with censorship and the zones, cables can take anything up to five days. Did you know that the police have a crazy notion that Harry was mixed up in some bracket? No, but everyone in Vienna is. We all sell cigarettes and exchange shillings for baths and that kind of thing. You won't find a single member of the control commission who hasn't broken the rules. The police meant something worse than that. They get rather absurd ideas sometimes, the man with the toupee said cautiously. I'm going to stay here until I prove them wrong. Kurtz turned his head sharply and the toupee shifted very slightly. He said, what's the good? Nothing can bring Harry back. I'm going to have that police officer run out of Vienna. I don't see what you can do. I'm going to start working back from his death. You were there, and this man Cooler, and the chauffeur, and then there's Harry's girl. Kurt said, it will be painful for her. I'm not concerned about her. I'm concerned about Harry. Do you know what it is that the police suspect? No. I lost my temper too soon. Has it occurred to you, Court said gently, that you might dig up something, well, discreditable to Harry? I'll risk that. It will take a bit of time and money. I've got time, and you were going to lend me some money, weren't you? <laughs> I'm not a rich man, Court said. I promised Harry to see that you were all right and that you get your plane back. You didn't worry about the money or the plane, Martin said. But I'll make a bet with you, in pound sterling, five pounds against two hundred shillings, that there's something queer about Harry's death. It was a shot in the dark, but already he had this firm instinctive sense that there was something wrong, though he hadn't yet attached the word murder to the instinct. Kurtz had a cup of coffee halfway to his lips, and Martin's watched him. The shot apparently went wide. An unaffected hand held the cup to the mouth, and Kurtz drank, a little noisily, in long sips. Well, he took another sip. Of course, I wish you luck, though I don't believe there's anything to find. Just ask me for any help you want. I want Cooler's address. Certainly, I'll write it down for you. Here it is. In the American zone. And yours? I've already put it underneath. I'm unlucky enough to be in the Russian zone. So don't visit me very late. Things sometimes happen round our way. He was giving one of his studied Viennese smiles, the charm carefully painted in with a fine brush in the little lines about the mouth and eyes. Keep in touch, he said. And if you need any help, but I still think you are very unwise. You touched the lone rider. I'm so proud to have met you. 
master of suspense. And one hand smoothed the toupee, while the other, passing softly over the mouth, brushed out the smile as though it had never been. Martin sat on a hard chair just inside the stage door of the Josefstadt Theatre. He had sent up his card to Anna Schmidt after the matinee, marking it Friend of Harry's. He'd had time to think. He was calm now. Martin's, not Rollo, was in the ascendant. When a light went out in one of the windows and an actress descended into the passage where he walked, he didn't even turn to take a look. He was done with all that. He thought, Kurtz is right. They're all right. I'm behaving like a romantic fool. I'll just have a word with Anna Schmidt, a word of commiseration, and then I'll pack and go. He'd quite forgotten, he told me, the complication of Mr. Crabbin. A voice over his head called, Mr. Martins? And he looked up at the face that watched him from between the two curtains a few feet above his head. It wasn't a beautiful face. He firmly explained to me when I accused him of once again mixing his drinks. Just an honest face. Dark hair and eyes which in that light looked brown. A wide forehead, large mouth which didn't try to charm. She said, will you come up, please? The second door on the right. There are some people, he explained to me carefully, whom one recognizes instantaneously as friends. You can be at ease with them because you know that never, never will you be in danger. That was Anna, he said. And I wasn't sure whether the past tense was deliberate or not. Unlike most actresses' rooms, this one was almost bare. No wardrobe packed with clothes, no clutter of cosmetics and grease paints. A dressing gown on the door, one sweater he recognized from Act Two on the only easy chair, a tin of half-used paints and grease. A kettle hummed softly on a gas ring. She said, would you like a cup of tea? Someone sent me a packet last week. Sometimes the Americans do, instead of flowers, you know, on the first night. Uh, I'd like a cup, he said. But if there was one thing he hated, it was tea. He watched her while she made it. Made it, of course, all wrong. The water not on the boil, the teapot unheated, too few leaves. She said, I never quite understand why English people like tea. He drank his cupful quickly like a medicine and watched her gingerly and delicately sip at hairs. He said, I wanted very much to see you. About Harry. 